Thanks for joining me for another episode of Reading Together from Seaharp Press. I'm Eugene Lunning, co-founder of Seaharp, and today we'll be continuing our enchanting journey through C.S. Lewis's The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. In this episode, we're going to be in chapter 11, the title of which is Aslan is Nearer. Edmund, meanwhile, had been having a most disappointing time. When the dwarf had gone to get the sledge ready, he expected that the witch would start being nice to him, as she had been at their last meeting. But she said nothing at all. And when at last Edmund plucked up his courage to say, Please, your majesty, could I have some Turkish delight? You, you said, she answered, Silence, fool! Then she appeared to change her mind and said, as if to herself, And yet it will do not do to have the brat fainting on the way, and once more clapped her hands. Another dwarf appeared. Bring the human creature food and drink, she said. The dwarf went away and presently returned, bringing an iron bowl with some water in it and an iron plate with a hunk of dry bread on it. He grinned in a repulsive manner as he set them down on the floor beside Edmund and said, Turkish delight for the little prince. Ha, ha, ha. Take it away, said Edmund sulkily. I don't want dry bread. But the witch suddenly turned on him with such a terrible expression on her face that he apologized and began to nibble at the bread, though it was so stale he could hardly get it down. You may be glad enough of it before you taste bread again, said the witch. While he was still chewing away, the first dwarf came back and announced that the sledge was ready. The white witch rose and went out, ordering Edmund to go with her. The snow was again falling as they came into the courtyard, but she took no notice of that and made Edmund sit beside her on the sledge. But before they drove off, she called Fenris Ulf, and he came bounding like an enormous dog to the side of the sledge. Take with you the swiftest of your wolves and go at once to the house of the beavers, said the witch, and kill whatever you find there. If they are already gone, then make all speed to the stone table, but do not be seen. Wait for me there in hiding. I, meanwhile, must go many miles to the west before I find a place where I can drive across the river. You may overtake these humans before they reach the stone table. You will know what to do if you find them. I hear and obey, O oh queen, growled the wolf, and immediately he shot away into the snow and darkness as quickly as a horse can gallop. In a few minutes, he had called another wolf, and was with him down on the dam and sniffing at the beaver's house. But of course they found it empty. It would have been a dreadful thing for the beavers and the children if the night had remained fine, for the wolves would then have been able to follow their trail, and ten to one would have overtaken them before they had got to the cave. But now that the snow had begun again, the scent was cold, and even the footprints were covered up. Meanwhile, the dwarf whipped up the reindeer, and the witch and Edmund drove out under the archway and on and away into the darkness and the cold. This was a terrible journey for Edmund, who had no coat. Before they had been going a quarter of an hour, all the front of him was covered with snow. He soon stopped trying to shake it off because, as quickly as he did that, a new lot gathered, and he was so tired Soon he was wet to the skin, and oh, how miserable he was. It didn't look now as if the witch intended to make him a king. All the things he had said to make himself believe that she was good and kind and that her side was really the right side sounded to him silly now. He would have given anything to meet the others at this moment, even Peter. The only way to comfort himself now was to try to believe that the whole thing was a dream and that he might wake up at any moment. And as they went on, hour after hour, it did come to seem like a dream. This lasted longer than I could describe, 
even if I wrote pages and pages about it. But I will skip on to the time when the snow had stopped and the morning had come and they were racing along in the daylight. And still they went on and on, with no sound but the everlasting swish of the snow and the creaking of the reindeer's harness. And then at last the witch said, What have we here? Stop! And they did. How Edmund hoped she was going to say something about breakfast. But she had stopped for quite a different reason. A little way off at the foot of a tree sat a merry party. A squirrel and his wife with their children and two satyrs and a dwarf and an old dog fox, all on stools round a table. Edmund couldn't quite see what they were eating, but it smelled lovely. And there seemed to be decorations of holly, and he wasn't at all sure he didn't see something like a plum pudding. At the moment when the sledge stopped, the fox, who was obviously the oldest person present, had just risen to his feet, holding a glass in its right paw as if it was going to say something. But when the whole party saw the sledge stopping and who was in it, all the gaiety went out of their faces. The father squirrel stopped eating with his fork halfway to his mouth, and one of the satyrs stopped with his fork actually in its mouth, and the baby squirrel squealed with terror. What is the meaning of this? asked the witch queen. Nobody answered. Speak, vermin, she said again. Or do you want my dwarf to find you a tongue with his whip? What is the meaning of all this gluttony, this waste, this self-indulgence? Where did you get all these things? Please, your majesty, said the fox. We were given them. And if I might make so bold as to drink your majesty's very good health, who gave them to you, said the witch. Father Christmas, stammered the fox. What? roared the witch, springing from the sledge and taking a few strides nearer to the terrified animals. He has not been here. He cannot have been here. How dare you? But no. Say you have been lying and you shall, even now, be forgiven. At that moment, one of the young squirrels lost its head completely. He has, he has, he has, it squeaked beating its little spoon on the table. Edmund saw the witch bite her lips so that a drop of blood appeared on her white cheek. Then she raised her wand. Oh, don't, don't, please don't, shouted Edmund. But even while he was shouting, she had waved her wand and instantly, where the merry party had been, there were only statues of creatures. One with its stone fork fixed forever, halfway to its stone mouth seated round a stone table on which there were stone plates and a stone plum pudding. As for you, said the witch, giving Edmund a stunning blow on the face as she remounted the sledge, let that teach you to ask favor for spies and traitors. Drive on! And Edmund, for the first time in this story, felt sorry for someone besides himself. It seemed so pitiful to think of those little stone figures sitting there all the silent days and all the dark nights, year after year, till the moss grew on them and at last even their faces crumbled away. Now they were steadily racing on again. And soon Edmund noticed that the snow which splashed against them as they rushed through it was much wetter than it had been all last night. At the same time, he noticed that he was feeling much less cold. It was also becoming foggy. In fact, every minute it grew both foggier and warmer. And the sledge was not running nearly as well as it had been running up till now. At first, he thought this was because the reindeer were tired, but soon he saw that that couldn't be the real reason. The sledge jerked and skidded, and kept on jolting as if it had struck against stones. And however the dwarf whipped the poor reindeer, the sledge went slower and slower. There also seemed to be a curious noise all around them, but the noise of their driving and jolting and the dwarfs shouting at the reindeer prevented Edmund from hearing what it was. 
until suddenly the sledge stuck so fast that it wouldn't go on at all. When that happened, there was a moment's silence. And in that silence, Edmund could at last listen to the other noise properly. A strange, sweet, rustling, chattering noise, and yet not so strange, for he knew he'd heard it before. If only he could remember where. Then all at once, he did remember. It was the noise of running water. All round them, though out of sight, there were streams chattering, murmuring, bubbling, splashing, and even, in the distance, roaring. And his heart gave a great leap, though he hardly knew why, when he realized that the frost was over. And much nearer, there was a drip, drip, drip from the branches of all the trees. And then, as he looked at one tree, he saw a great load of snow slide off it. And for the first time since he had entered Narnia, he saw the dark green of a fir tree. But he hadn't time to listen or watch any longer, for the witch said, Don't sit staring, fool! Get out and help! And of course, Edmund had to obey. He stepped out into the snow, but it was really only slush by now, and began helping the dwarf to get the sledge out of the muddy hole it had got into. They got it out in the end, and by being very cruel to the reindeer, the dwarf managed to get it on the move again, and they drove a little further. And now the snow was really melting in earnest, and patches of green grass were beginning to appear in every direction. Unless you have looked at a world of snow as long as Edmund had been looking at it, you will hardly be able to imagine what a relief those green patches were after the endless white. Then the sledge stopped again. It's no good, your majesty, said the dwarf. We can't sledge in this thaw. Then we must walk, said the witch. We shall never overtake them walking, growled the dwarf, not with the start they've got. Are you my counselor or my slave, said the witch. Do as you're told. Tie the hands of the human creature behind it and keep hold of the end of the rope. And take your whip and cut the harness of the reindeer. They'll find their own way home. The dwarf obeyed. And in a few minutes, Edmund found himself being forced to walk as fast as he could with his hands tied behind him. He kept on slipping in the slush and mud and wet grass, and every time he slipped, the dwarf gave him a curse and sometimes a flick with the whip. The witch walked behind the dwarf and kept on saying, Faster! Faster! Every moment, the patches of green grew bigger and the patches of snow grew smaller. Every moment, more and more of the trees shook off their robes of snow. Soon, wherever you looked, Instead of white shapes, you saw the dark green of firs or the black prickly branches of bare oaks and beeches and elms. Then the mist turned from white to gold and presently cleared away altogether. Shafts of delicious sunlight struck down onto the forest floor and overhead you could see a blue sky between the treetops. Soon there were more wonderful things happening. Coming suddenly round a corner into a glade of silver birch trees, Edmund saw the ground covered in all directions with little yellow flowers, celandines. The noise of water grew louder. Presently, they actually crossed a stream. Behind it, they found snowdrops growing. Mind your own business, said the dwarf, when he saw that Edmund had turned his head to look at them, and he gave the rope a vicious jerk. But of course, this didn't prevent Edmund from seeing. Only five minutes later, he noticed a dozen crocuses growing round the foot of an old tree, gold and purple and white. Then came a sound even more delicious than the sound of the water. Close beside the path they were following, a bird suddenly chirped from the branch of a tree. It was answered by the chuckle of another bird a little further off. And then, as if that had been a signal, there was chattering and chirping in every direction, and then a moment of full song. And within five minutes, the whole wood 
was ringing with birds' music, and wherever Edmund's eyes turned, he saw birds alighting on branches or sailing overhead or having their little quarrels. Faster, faster, said the witch. There was no trace of the fog now. The sky became bluer and bluer, and now there were white clouds hurrying across it from time to time. In the wide glades, there were primroses. A light breeze sprang up, which scattered drops of moisture from the swaying branches and carried cool, delicious scents against the faces of the travelers. The trees began to come fully alive. The larches and birches were covered with green, the laburnums with gold. Soon the beech trees had put forth their delicate, transparent leaves. As the travelers walked under them, the light also became green. A bee buzzed across their path. This is no thaw, said the dwarf, suddenly stopping. This is spring. What are we to do? Your winter has been destroyed, I tell you. This is Aslan's doing. If either of you mention that name again, said the witch, she, he shall instantly be killed. Hmm. I don't know about you, but listening to sort of that evocative sense of the springtime coming, especially because I happen to be recording this chapter on an actual snow day. My kids are downstairs. They're having a day off school. I'm just reminded that in this particular season in which I record this, there's this sense of the hopefulness of spring, of that beauty of the new creation, which, if you stop to think about it, is the most perfect picture you can imagine of the new creation that the Lord Jesus has brought to the earth, has actually completed, has finished, has made ours by his work on the cross and in the resurrection. So one thing I just wanted to point out from that chapter that caught my attention, when the queen is coming along and she stops and finds those animals enjoying the beauty of that feast sitting there under that tree, I don't know if you noticed this, but the queen gets out of her sledge and she says, what is the meaning of all this gluttony, this waste, this self-indulgence? And it caught my attention that as the queen is sort of a figure for the evil one, how perfect to describe the way that the evil one wants us to be, which is frankly not happy not enjoying the goodnesses of the Lord, even the simple ones. And so for this reputation the evil one has for being the one who's saying, yes, enjoy gluttony, enjoy self-indulgence, the reality is he doesn't want us to enjoy anything at all. Anything good is contrary to the nature of the evil one. But I also loved this. In this edition on page 117, as Edmund starts to see the spring breaking forth, I love that it says, but of course, this didn't prevent Edmund from seeing. My reminder to you and to myself is that even those around us who do not yet know the glories of heaven and of the kingdom of heaven and of its king, Jesus, friends, the evil one cannot prevent them from seeing at times even little glimpses of how good he is. So do you know what our job is? It's to live in such a way that it's clear that the springtime of the kingdom has come. To live daily lives so filled, so really possessed with the joy, the overwhelmedness about how good Jesus is, that other people will not be able to help themselves from seeing it. So friends, let's go live that way today. Let's be filled with the joy of the Lord. And let's make clear to people that not only is Aslan on the move, not only has Jesus come, but he is still alive and he is still working in our day today. Thanks for joining me. That was chapter 11 of The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. I look forward to our next episode and I'm grateful to have you with me. Have a wonderful rest of your day.